Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Daniel Umstead, host of the RNG Radio Show. I'm really excited about my next guest. He is actually the CEO of his own call center that's actually based out in Costa Rica. Uh, but I want to run through his bio real quick because uh, there's going to be some interesting facts and uh, information uh, that you'll hear about him. But first and foremost, uh, my guest, his uh, journey in the call center space uh, started with fulls of twists and turns, as most call center spaces do. Uh, when he was 27 years old, he had relocated to Costa Rica to train employees for one of the largest call centers in San Jose. Uh, with a mix of motivational public speaking style backed by tactful and appropriate rhetoric, Richard shared his knowledge and trained over 10,000 bilingual telemarketers. This 10,000 folks, feel free to write that down because it is four zeros. Uh, Richard Block has the largest collection of restored American pinball machines and antique rock hole jukeboxes in Central America, making gamif gamification a strong part of CCC culture. Uh, he currently holds and still has since 2008, the chief executive officer for Costa Rica's call center. Um, he also holds a bachelor's degree in communications and Spanish uh, from the University of Arizona and a Certificate of Language Proficiency from the University of Sevilla, Spain, España, uh, for uh, Amigas and Amigas, and a keynote speaker for Philadelphia's Abington High School 68th National Honor Society induction ceremony. Giving back always, he missed his part in his bio, but always giving back to Abington Senior High School. Um, it is very important to Mr. Block. As such, he endows a scholarship each year for students that plan on majoring in a world language at the university level. So, scholarship, call center, and ladies and gentlemen, I usually don't like to give out private information, but I am going to be on this show. Uh, you have to understand, my son is currently going to school at Abington Middle School. Richard and I met through a podcast directory where he has to be on my show, so such a small world this is that a future alum, um, and now I'm speaking to a past alum all coming together. So, because Abington ain't big, but it ain't small either. So, just being able to connect is just an amazing thing. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Block. So, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Daniel, I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here today. And I got to tell you, I've done over 100 podcasts, but when I do one in Philadelphia, you know it's my favorite. There we go. There we go. Let's go Eagles. I can't say anything else about anybody else. This is, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening or watching right now, this is after the failed World Series with Houston, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, Sixers somewhat 12 and 10 strong last time I checked, but let's go Eagles. I'm not going to talk about the Commanders game, but let's go Eagles. Remember our <laughs> Philadelphia Flyers as well. Yes, yes. And them too. And them too. I, ho hockey comes and goes for me, man. Hawks and Cubs and Cubs, so might, might as well include, what is it, the Wings, and uh, what do we got, the uh, Union Soccer as well, uh, down in Chester, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about my old Broad Street bullies, my favorite athlete of all time, Bernie Perrant, their goalie that took him to the Stanley Cup, and so oh, those man. are the days my dad used to take me down to the Spectrum to watch the, watch the boys play. Oh man, now we're talking, uh, what is it, before, uh, yeah, before Wells Fargo, because it was Wachovia beforehand, wasn't it? What was the name of the stadium? We're, we're talking about the 70s right here. <laughs> oh, okay. Never mind then. Never mind. We're going to skip through. Skip oh, we're through. going way old school <laughs> with Bobby so, Clark and Perron and, you know, and, and Bill Barber and those guys and Dave Schultz. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely taking it back. Definitely taking it back. Well, uh, Richard, tell me your story, man. What, what um, I, I know I've read a brief of the bio, but, you know, what got you interested in the call center space? You know, 10,000 bilingual telemarketers. Um, being able to train them and, you know, scale where you're at right now. Like, what got you started? Tell me your story, man. Well, I was given a one in a million opportunity, Daniel, back in August of 2000. A very good friend of mine who owned a call center here said, Richie, why don't you come down for a couple months and teach some English? Well, that barn door was open. I wasn't coming back to the States. And I worked <laughs> for my friend center for four years. I learned the business from the inside out, not sea level, but as an agent. And I cracked some codes. I saw what to do in order to enhance the experience, give some more dignity and empathy and make it happen. But I gotta let you know something. If it weren't for my beloved Abington Senior High School, <laughs> and I'm so proud of my ghosts. I did so much stuff outside of the classroom. I was encouraged to not only be a tri-letterman, but also get involved in student government. I raised a bunch of money for the high school and I was not an honor roll student. I wasn't that model student, 
but I was very loyal and I knew where my strengths were. And even the late principal Norman Schmidt wrote me a college recommendation letter to get into the University of Arizona. Without that, I don't know if I would have put the ball in the end zone. I'll be forthright with you. Gotcha. So I paid forward. But I do know this, that growing up in Northeast Philadelphia, what it did was there are some individuals out there that really have vigor. We have our pride. We have our rocky 15 rounds. But there was something about where I grew up where the friendships were so unique. And so there was a lot of depth to it. Friends would push you, but also pick you up and they would get you to be the best you could be. And you earned your spots on the sports team. You, you earned student government, you earned your friends. And so when it came to Abington, I believe in old school, really old school. And so when I come back every five years for my reunion and I see all of my amazing friends and I'm, I'm very good friends with the current principal, Angelo Barrios, he's just an amazing man and so many teachers. It's something where it grounds me. It reminds me where I came from, how my journey was so long, but so short at the same time. What I did was, Daniel, I was very true to myself. I loved Spanish, so I decided to double down on my favorite class. There were a lot of opinions that were provided to me and some pressures to go to Ivy League and to study medicine and law like my family did. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm considered, I can't say the rebel, but let's say I was the dreamer and I knew that if I lived within a box, I wouldn't be happy. And so by doing something like this, I've been able to fulfill my own spiritual quest, my friend. Awesome. Awesome. I love that, man. With because uh, we're going to be deep diving and, and I'm going to get some gems out of you. Uh, the first one, you know, you started off as an agent with the call center, you know, yes. now CEO uh, throughout your tenure. We're talking, you know, of course, over 10 years. In yeah. your opinion and what you've seen, what does it take to be a leader? You need to be humble as much as you want to have your paper, your position and your parking spot. People can always quit. And so if nobody shows up at your Chuck E. Cheese birthday party, you have no friends. And so I realized something very, very quickly that people have lives outside of the office. They have families that they're raising. They have their own pride. I am a guest in this country. I might be an owner of a company, but I'm not native Costa Rican. I'm from Philadelphia. And so by learning a second language and extending that sort of good faith and interest in their culture, I was received in a very positive way. So it's enabled me to delegate and promote certain people that I saw had skills and potential. And I also like to find individuals that don't have bad habits, might be brand new in the industry, where you and I can mold them like a knight to a squire. And so for me, I give a little bit of Philly guilt, but I also get them to be the best. I'm proud in your work. Look at me in my eyes and shake my hand. I'll know your name. I'll break bread with you. I'll play pinball with you at the call center because I want to see the best out of you. And I believe that the best leaders are the ones that produced leaders. And they're the ones that have somebody that says good morning to them or makes a suggestion or not afraid to come to your office to tell you if they're having a good day or a bad day. If they're afraid of me that I'm doing something wrong and you can't judge me on what happened at your last job as I'm not judging you on the bad agent that wouldn't come to work or make his calls. Right. So I think in regards to maturity, I think maybe shattering any sort of misconceptions people have in regards to business owners, you and I might be able to create a certain company culture where people don't leave and they grow and they wanna be better. And so for me, when there's wind in my sails, I can't believe it that people are willing to put that so much uh, fuerza, so much force into their work. And so when they come and their wives or husbands pick them up or their mothers come to the office, I'll make sure to go downstairs in my suit and I will tell Daniel's mother how amazing you are and why you're amazing. <laughs> and that's the sort of gift that keeps on giving because I'm very authentic. After 15 years of my own company and 22 in the industry, I made a good name for myself. Now, not everybody loves me. There are some haters out there, but it's usually because they hate themselves. 
if somebody leaves without a two weeks notice, if they can't look at me in my eye, if they can't just say, thank you very much. And we had a good run together. That's on you. It's your ball that you dropped, you fumbled. Because what I've tried to do here once again is to give everybody a fair shake and see what I can do to promote them and make them more self-reliant and self-confident. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate that, man, you know, so much. And it, you know, just goes with the leadership quality. Um, it, it shouldn't be that fear. It, you know, they say like the greats, kings and queens of our pastime and such has always put that fear in the people, you know, to make them love them. But when you're actually building somebody, you know, it does it for itself. And I mean, it's proven um, with the 10,000, you know, most folks can't even say that they've came across 10,000 people in their lives. But for the yeah. fact that you manage train and built up 10,000 says a lot. And I'm pretty sure there's more to that because I always look at, you know, each one teach one. So as you're teaching these 10,000, you're creating this generation and expansion. Even when you do come to the school and give your speech, it's not so much what you're putting into those kids. It's what those kids are taking from, taking back to the families or when they do have their own families, giving it right back. So I, I really, really appreciate you for that. Um, there's some... Um, techniques that we were talking about and uh, strategies. And I want to definitely go over each one. Uh, can we talk about the famous buffer boomerang technique? Explain to the folks that. What is that? My buffer boomerang technique. Let me see if I got this for you. <laughs> can you see this? <laughs> yes. Uh, for the folks that are listening on Spotify, it says at the bottom, that is a good question. And we're starting from the left minus two that's a buffer moving over to the right in my vision to a plus two. So yeah, you're gonna have to, um, folks, if you, I know you're probably listening on Spotify, make sure you're checking this out on YouTube as well, but uh, feel free to uh, explain it for us. Well, the buffer boomerang technique, it's an excellent way to readjust the tone on a phone call. A lot of the times people might bark at you and they might be rude. They might raise their voice or just have an inappropriate tone. And so what I like to do, for an example, is I, I like to buffer that negativity, okay, by doing a name drop. Daniel, then I will say, that's an excellent question. I'll repeat the question, what's the name of my company? Costa Rica's Call Center. And so what I can do is I can buffer the tone, slow it down, name drop. You say, that's a good question. Glad you brought it up. Okay, we were just about to talk about that. So glad we're going to discuss that. Then you repeat the question to show engagement and active listening and send it back. And so it's almost like the robot. They send it into you, you send it back, send it in and send it back. And there's excellent ways to readjust tones. And it's a great way that after you practice it, it becomes second nature for you. So people don't get frustrated. And there are ways once again to prolong a conversation, to manipulate it, to at least give you 15 rounds to make your pitch before you um, can convert the call. I love that, man. And the name drop is so key. I mean, I know that you know this, but folks that are listening, you know, whatever your industry is, if you're dealing with customers or um, B2B, B2C in some way, fashion, or form, the name drop is just so effective in getting your point across. Because um, for a moment, one, it's a great listening because people just love to hear their name. I love to hear my name when I'm talking to folks, you know, and they're like, hey, Daniel, you know, I'm even be more attentive. I'm on radio show. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but the name drop you know, pulls people in, it draws them in. And it's like, okay, you know what, Richard is actually listening to me. He's actually taking the time. And that buffer technique, as you said, it's the robot motion. The moment that you say somebody's name, they're like, huh, what? Yeah, okay, it, it changes their whole mood, you know, mm -hmm. no matter what they're going through. And they might still, you know, rant and rave and still have a few choice words, but getting them to that point by calming them down, saying their name and throwing back at them. It's not just, I want folks to realize, it's not just a call center thing. It's not just a telemarketer thing. It is your business. You should be addressing folks by their first name. Now, if they prefer Mr. and Miss, what have you, feel free to run with it. But at the end of the day, that name drop is essential to keep your business moving forward man awesome okay. Love that. my good friend you don't want to overkill the name drop like if you now, say now how often yeah now of course i'm just uh saying in general most of these folks uh, that are probably listening maybe you have a like five to ten minutes uh intro pitch uh based upon your skill set and your tenure and your experience how often should a name drop be done i think 
that you should use it for transitional sentences and confirmations, even rebuttals. Okay, so if you're switching topics, use that as a bridging center. So Daniel, why don't we talk about Philadelphia more? Or Daniel, this makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, there are certain ways to do that. Or Daniel, did you choose ABC or one, two, three? Those are great times. There, there's are almost checkpoints. Think of it like bread of a sandwich. Top and bottom connects the middle. What do we do in the middle? Personal pronouns, your, are. It's the cousin of the name drop. So you can do a five to a six to a one because in every sentence there is a personal pronoun. My suggestion is to split up a sentence is by giving it a quarter second slide. So you could say your pause and then continue. So as you're saying, capturing information is the cousin of the name drop, they're still paying attention. And it is the trigger word, it's the spike for emphasis. I believe in pausing before names and numbers. Now, you and I are looking at each other right now, and it's great because we're both good looking, but in most of these phone calls, you can't see the person. So there's right. a lot of difficult times to gauge the reactions. So my suggestion, because the average attention span is about 30 seconds to two minutes, think of it as a boxing match. You're not getting 10 minutes. You're going to be buying 30 second shots. And so if we can do these checkpoints, there's a great way. Once again, we're buying another 30 seconds to a minute. Now we spoke about the buffer boomerang. Usually prior to that, if I may make a suggestion in regards to individuals that are prospecting phone calls, what they should do if they're calling business to consumer or business to business is do a company name spiker as you are in the real estate industry. And what I used to calling FISBOs and cancels and expireds, would I would give the uh, address spike. Hey, one, two, three Main Street. And then I would say, how are you doing today? Not how Daniel's doing today. He might not be doing well. That could be a hang up. I will ask, hey, how's, you know, Jones Pizza doing today? And most of the time, if not all of the time, I'm going to say it better than the person answering the phone. It's going to snap that gatekeeper out of the salesperson hang up. It's going to reduce them from a 10 to a five. So at least you got a shot from the buffer boomerang of who are you? So right. glad that you asked. My name is Richard Blank. <laughs> I mean, it's a great way just to throw it right back at him. And right. um, when you get a name, you got to make sure prior to a transfer to a decision maker, or if you let them know that they did an excellent job and you give them a positive verbal escalation. And then you're also going to let them know that you're going to speak to their boss about them. Because when the boss picks up the phone, the first thing I'm going to say before introducing myself is, hey, Daniel is one of the greatest employers you got. <laughs> they don't even know me yet, but it's like a mystery. Right, right. But, but they do know. They do know their employee. And it's like, what? Okay. All right. So okay, I right. have shown good faith. I gave the gift. And also your gatekeeper gave me the pass to pitch. So initially, I'm already starting off with at least a minute's worth of free play. And so I can properly introduce myself. I can set the pace and make the call. And then when I'm done, I'll do it in writing. I'll, I'll do a follow-up thank you email. And I'll also mention how amazing this individual was that assisted me. So when I call your company back, your home back or wherever you're calling, the Richard Circle is complete. That individual thanked mm -hmm. me for complimenting them after all the years they've been working there. Add momentum to my call. Give me more company or family culture information. Little, little, little goodies that will assist you in moving that ball further down the way. And these are things that won't compromise your ethics, values, or morals. All I'm doing is thanking those individuals, paying it forward for those amazing first impression people that answer your phone and stand at your gates. And so for me, those have been the people that have gotten me the first class plane ticket the biggest lobster tail at the restaurant, or even that table when they've been packed for Mother's Day. You're nice to the maitre d', you're nice to the chef, you're nice to the, to the waitresses. And once they start getting promoted, they don't forget about you. Yeah. And you're the ones that wrote to their supervisors on those comments, cards, and how amazing they were. Mm -hmm. And so these are the sort of simple things in your bedside manner, Daniel, that can give you that much more enriched relationship with your clients yeah dang that that's good that's good i i got you know a ton of questions uh one of them with the name because uh some of these names are unique you know that they're not a richard or daniel some bar got 25 syllables in them 
what has been your best technique uh, for the ones that, you know, names may have been forgotten, you know, during conversation or, you know, just in general asking, like, what is your best method in, you know, re-asking somebody what their name is or even pronouncing it for them? Let's do the combo. First, prior to using the military alphabet to ensure it's a B or a D, you mm-hmm. know, Bravo, Delta, you know, it's, it's you got to use that. And prior to that saying, Daniel, your last name is very exotic and wonderful. And I really would prefer to pronounce it correctly for you. Would you please, you know, pronounce it for me? Because like in Spanish, the H doesn't have a sound and the vowels are a little bit different. And that's okay. I've let my agents write out words phonetically so they say it properly, but still know how to spell it. But yes, these exotic names, when most people guess or they have emails bounce back and place the blame on someone because they were born somewhere in the world where that's a common name, that's not fair. And they're almost expecting you to talk about the white elephant in the room, my 20 letter name with five X's in it. How do you pronounce it? And it's just, and it's amazing. Like, you know, when I was a little boy, could you spell Chappaquiddick? You know, those are the fun things to do or spell Mississippi. Those are some of the yeah. tough words. <laughs> uh, all these doing this. Come on, you remember in first grade, things. those are the tough oh, words. Oh yeah, uh, especially what the challenges in between, uh, you know, school breaks or after school, but you can't say Mississippi Fest, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. But Love you remember days, the yeah. first time you cracked that code. And so if you don't ask, it's an insult. If you do ask in a way, how do you spell your name? That's kind of off beating, but letting them know that you are open-minded for other cultures and showing that sort of respect because you don't know when to sit, when to ask for something. What what are the manners in your home? What's the manners in regards to your name pronunciation that's been passed down from generations? And so for me, just like the positive escalation to a gatekeeper, I've had people say, Richard, out of the last 30 people I've spoken to, you're the only one that asked how to spell it and after three times can pronounce it correctly. Thank you very much. Wow. And they yeah, remember man. that. They remember Why? that. that what, that's... what are you dancing around? <laughs> this is something that needs to be sliced and diced slowly, but you can say it prior. Let them know that their name sounds amazing. And I would love to be able to pronounce it correctly. And when they say it, you know you're not going to understand it. And that's when you use the military alphabet. And when you hit the military alphabet, then they know you're serious. First, they probably think you served in the military, but second, they realize that you're taking it very seriously because that is, in my industry, that's the easiest way to decipher a spelling. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate that so much. Um, Another uh, strategy I wanted to talk about, uh, interpersonal communication conflict management strategy. Could you deep dive into that a bit as well? Absolutely. Well, there's always conflict and it just depends on how you manage it. And so for me, I I look into things many different ways. First and foremost, I I give somebody the benefit of the doubt. That's number one, if I have a track record with them. Secondly, I'll take into consideration that there might be some things outside of the office, Daniel, that could be affecting them. For an example, my good friend just got married. So you know you're in the best mood every day, all day. I can see you. Uh, Every day. (laughs) You actually look taller since the last time we spoke. (laughs) I I feel myself growing. I know. These are the sort of things I can see you on a high. But you also judge somebody's character during chaos. And Mm -hmm. I want to see if somebody has the maturity, the impulse control, or the experience to handle it. And so for me, unless they're breaking labor laws or scratching my car, I'm the first person to do a timeout. Let's go get some water on the face, maybe some coffee. And that's just from a boss to an employee perspective. But also, I believe in two ears and one mouth, the greatest thing for me to do is to listen first. And once you're done, if we take turns, there might be things that aren't important to you. I see your priority now. I could have been miscommunicating or understanding something because of my own position or emotion. So a lot of the times I've reset myself by listening to somebody's point of view. Finally, if it's very important, like a Thanksgiving dinner, a marriage, a best friend or just something, if you are given, Daniel, the luxury of time, my suggestion would be to write a draft and not send it to sleep on it 
go to the gym, work out on it. Think about it. Because the following day when the dust settles, there's a very good chance you see where the priorities are. You realize you overextended yourself, didn't say enough. And possibly, Dan, you might even be apologizing for your tone. And I love I, that. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, it's it's so noted. Uh, what I used to do um, prior to me getting married to this beautiful love of my life um, oh, yes. had not so of a good uh, marriage the first round. And what I would do um, instead of you know either lashing it out and letting the world know or even letting her know, I would send the information to myself. I would email it to myself. And I look back now because there's some stuff I'm like, what the hell was wrong with you, man? Um, but it's best that I kept it internalized, you know, and being able to look back and I'm like, you know what, it really wasn't that serious or even more so it really wasn't that deep. So being able to manage that, you know, definitely has done a lot. The other thing um, that I wanted to talk about that somebody had pointed out, and I want, I want to get your feedback and take on it. I was reading something where they said, imagine if you were charged like $1,000 per word, would you still say as much as you would in regards to an email response or even get back to somebody? So based upon, you know, that, like, do you feel that it's true or do you feel that, you know, there are some times that you do need to explain fully everything, whether it be in an email response or even over the phone? Depends on your relationship with the person. If it's your best friend, guess what? You don't even need to say a single word. And I'm sure yeah. your beautiful wife finishes sentences for you, which would have saved you a couple thousand. All those I, I'm, I'm usually, yes, yes, dear. Is she a yes, dear, a lot. Do you still have to pay? Like, if you don't speak, but your wife speaks, <laughs> you have to pay for that. I'm trying to figure out how many times I, I should be uh, paying her for me saying yes, dear. So, exactly. how much are <laughs> bill is she running up? But, um, right, right. But, but to answer your question, it's, it's, it's almost like this. The greatest thing to ever have with someone is a comfortable silence. But if you are talking about something where I can't see somebody and I have to write and charge per word, uh, I think you could make it almost to a one word sort of thing because Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain things in the simplest of terms, you don't understand enough. You, like you're calling me for my call center services. I'm calling you for real estate. You, let's pick words, contract, money, showings, open house. You tell me or trust, confidence. Yeah. How about someone that's got, you know, uh, reliability? Because all this stuff anybody can have, it's, it's like when you see somebody with money, anybody can get money. It just depends on what you do with it. Right. And so I could, why do I need to write you five pages to convince myself? I should have it done on merit. And almost if I might think about it, I say, Google me. <laughs> How about that? $2,000, <laughs> Google me. So when you Google me, then you can read a million dollars worth of stuff and see pictures. I don't know how much you charge for pictures, but um, maybe I should do it that way. But I, I believe that my past action should speak more than my future words. Mm. And, and maybe just by knowing that expat, that's interesting. So this gentleman decided to move abroad, second language. That's interesting. Who is this individual? You know, that or even someone that says marathon runner. I think I might rather choose to hire that individual than, than college professor, because I think it's a lot tougher to run a marathon, in my personal opinion. That's some serious yeah. mental and physical stuff. Yeah. So you tell me, maybe I'll just throw you off and throw out the color purple. Purple. <laughs> See where that goes. But right. um, maybe I'll have you write me back saying, can you explain? But uh <laughs> If, if you're making me spend thousands of dollars to convince you to do business with me, you're not the sort of client that I need. I want somebody that has the best relationship where we can meet in the middle and, and that I don't need to have leverage against me. And so for me, if I'm feeling uncomfortable initially, fine. But if the world says I got to put a $5,000 bid to earn your business and that's just the name of the game, so be it. But I tell you what, when I've had to push rocks uphill like Sisyphus to earn someone's business or to, or to convince them on who I am prior to a contract when I don't even know this individual, that's not fair. I think that everybody, as I mentioned before, should, should come with a clean slate. 
And maybe prior to business, we should talk about who we are personally, if we're looking to have a long-term relationship and possibly get through speed bumps together, because we're, we're, we're talking on a high. We're, it's the honeymoon stage. What happens when it gets tough? Do you take off your mask? Do you change? Or is it something that we have such a foundation, Daniel? Maybe the word I would use for you, buddy, foundation. Yeah, mm -hmm. because without that foundation, we're not building any sort of buildings. Your structure mm -hmm. has no substance. So how about that? Take by grand, put me down for foundation. How does that sound? I, that's I actually it, applicable for your industry too. <laughs> no, no, no. And it, it just starts with that. I mean, even with the real estate, um, and I'll, I'll even say, I'll even backtrack it even more so with the radio show my beginning process for the radio show was not set up on any foundation. It wasn't until I realized the foundation in itself needed to be the guest. Before I was waking up at 5 a.m., 7-ish, uh, trying to start the day doing a hoorah-rah in regards to motivation. I wasn't even getting up for myself. And then it moved into, you know, oh, well, I could talk about credit repair because I was working that. And I'm also a real estate agent, so I could talk about real estate tips. And I got 10 plus years in, you know, staffing and recruiting, so I could share that. And it boiled down to the opportunity where I had a few, well, I shouldn't say a few, it turned into about 50 people, um, but I had a group of folks um, that I was connected on a Facebook group and they said, yeah, I would love to be on your podcast. And I'm like, that's it. And ever since that foundation, if you will, it helped build up to where it's at right now. So yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I love you, love your take on it because folks get so wrapped up and it's like, oh man, e even my main job, the, the nine to five, they love me here. So they don't mind me bragging about them, but we do executive search and we at times need to come up with this quote unquote presentation, you know, in regards to wanting to win the client's business or talk about what we do. And not so much, of course, I'm going into the next sales pitch call, executive call saying, hey, foundation, call us in the morning. But, you know, leading with it's like, hey, as much as I've done research on your company, you should have done research on my company and what we've done, especially when I'm giving you the material and meeting in the middle. You know, so many folks who are brand new real estate agents, I, I see that, you know, they're so pressured to get their name out there to push everything. It's like, hey, this is what we do. This is what we do. This is the real estate industry. Here's some tips and tricks without coming to the table and something as simple as, hey, one, two, three Main Street, tell me about it. You know, rather than saying, dear expired listing user, I came across your property in the MLS and wanted to find out more information. You, you got to make it personable to where it doesn't feel that awkwardness, you know, do your own icebreaker, if you will, by getting to know more about them. And if they're coming to the table and it's like, well, who's Daniel? You know, who's Richard? Then already it's like, oh, uh, I, I don't mean to brag, but some good looking guys. You, you didn't bother to do some research on me first before we came to the table. And it shows you what type of ethic and character that they come from. You're so. allowed to brag. When I would yeah. call, not before 10 a.m. Uh, you got Richard, you got to tell them again. You got to tell them again. We, we, what we do call they that Daniel. We, we <laughs> call it a self wrap, and it can actually be used well on the phone. You just mentioned yourself. Hey, out of the last nine people that called you, Daniel, I'm the only one that did the due diligence on your house. I told you about the sport court in the back. I love the curb appeal, and your kitchen's amazing. Look what you did with that island. And so, I mean, when I, my favorite thing was Sundays. I go, instead of watching the Eagles game, I'm on the phone right now trying to list your property. Daniel, isn't that the sort of person you'd like to work with? There's nothing wrong with a self rep. I call you before the end of business today. I will make sure to follow up with an email. So if you follow through on first downs, don't be surprised if you get a touchdown. There's nothing wrong with high fives if you score. It's okay, you need that sort of positive reinforcement. Bragging is when you don't do anything and you say that you could. And also as Chris Rock said, you don't get credit for things you're supposed to do. And so for my opinion, if you're doing the above and beyond, showing the bedside matter and just being Daniel, the amazing guy that you are, and that's why your podcast is blowing up, you know, the market speaks, man. And if no one watched it, no one would call. And if I didn't enjoy your work, I wouldn't have begged to be on your show because I love what you do. I'm a huge fan. And Thanks, man. so that's just the way you got to look at it. There are certain times you can look at yourself in the mirror, give yourself five, wink at yourself. 
it's yeah. good. It's all right. You need to do this. You're your best friend. Don't be so hard yeah. on yourself. Not you, yeah, and your audience. No, 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 no. And I, I want that because, and, and that, that was the reason why I started this show, Richard. I had so many folks, and I mean, that of course you said, we got been on a hundred plus, uh, but I've had these folks who, you know, started their business, they got a product, they got a brand, they got a service that needs to get out to the world. And I'm like, use my show as your platform. Use this stepping stone. You give me the questions that you want me to ask you. So that way, the next time that you're out and about or having to talk your business, you're able to say, hey, check me out on the RNG radio show. And then even from there, get on more shows. And as you said, it's okay to brag about yourself. But as you said, Chris Rocket pointed it out, you're not going to get, uh, you know, benefited from things that you're supposed to do. You know, it's just taking that additional step, you know, pointing out, you know, the pool in the back. Because not saying that every house in Jersey has a pool, but when you can actually notice it and point it out or don't get confused and say like, oh, wait, 124 Main Street has a pool, not 123 Main Street, you know, you're taking that extra step that nobody else is going to do. So I love that, man. Um, I want to ask, because you've been doing this for a while, and you may have a few, three or four, uh, potentially more. What has been your greatest success? Because I, I came, I come from a call center, um, you know, working overnight, the third shift hour. Uh, what has been, if you can share, what has been like your greatest success with an agent, like somebody that may have gotten started off and, you know, flourish? Can you share about that? Absolutely. Since English is their second language, it's very important for me to, to hold that, you know, in a very delicate way. I, I prefer to use a thesaurus so I can expand on their similes, expand their vocabulary so it's more diplomatic and strategic. Instead of using words like help, I'll change it out for assist, guide, and lend a hand. These are certain things that can adjust the tone of a call. In addition to that, instead of saying, excuse me, what did you say with bad connections, dogs in the background, static? I'll fall on that sword, Daniel. I'll say for my clarification, for my edification, was it ABC or one, two, three? These are things that we do, but really what I've seen in this industry where there's so much burnout and people can put a bad taste in your mouth and you know, people get phone calls during dinner and you also have the Wolf of Wall Street, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and all these other big movies out there, uh, you know, to Wall Street just to show telemarketers and selling stock. But not all of us sell stock, and some people make a very good living making and receiving phone calls. I believe in the art of speech. Daniel, today, most companies are looking for omni-channel non-voice communication, where you're filling out a form, doing a chat, or sending an email. Well, that only elevates frustration levels. It's latent to get your response. And when you finally get someone on the phone, you're popping, exploding, and guns a-blazing. I believe that you still need to have interpersonal communication with your clients for retention, for upselling, for referrals. And let's look at it in a mature way, my friend. Let's say you lost an account. If you are given the luxury of an exit interview, we can find out what the competition did to earn their business or what you did to drop the ball. And so what I'm trying to do and succeeding is allowing these individuals to calm down, slow down and build on their rhetorical skills and to become very proficient speakers. So they become marketable. They can earn more in call centers. And you know this perfectly well, if you're talented, you can make a lot of money. In fact, some people at my center earn more than doctors and attorneys in Costa Rica. But being in this industry and sitting in those cubicles and never really seeing what a call center looked like before coming down here, it really opened my eyes. And it's a fun environment. There's a lot of synergy. And if people are really engaged and really wanna do dedicated practice, so they master their script, they really listen, they know how to pronounce names, Time flies, they become very fulfilled and they'll get promoted quickly. And I myself, it was interesting, Daniel, I was never a supervisor nor a manager for any job I had, none of them. <laughs> and this one here, I went from agent to owning a call center. So I, I never became jaded. I never had to do office politics. My friend, I never forgot what got me here. The true Abington essence. If you know what I mean, but yeah. um, 
But it never stopped, my friend, since I was 18 years old. I made a commitment to myself to be true. And the stars became aligned. I was very fortunate. This should have never happened. And so when these individuals are here with me, there is a responsibility of a payroll, an insurance. Mm -hmm. It's not game time anymore. And so knowing that you feed so many families, it's you almost feel the weight of your world on your back, but someone's got to carry it. Let it be me. And I believe that by having that sort of responsibility and giving that job stability and promoting people, doing this for almost, you know, 15 years, it's, it's been a great run. And so when I'm with the agents, they can feel the sincerity. They know I, I call the balls and the strikes and I'll be the first one there to congratulate them if they rip the call. And that's what I'm trying to do. I, I just want to build their confidence. So when they leave my office, they leave working with me, they can confront any sort of challenges that they have outside of the office and win. Love that, man. Love that. The 10,000 number, you know, we talked about it in the bio, you hit 10,000 bilingual call center agents. When did that happen for you? When were you like looking and it's like, wait a second. I helped over 10,000 people. Like when, when did that come to you? And you know, what was your emotion and reaction about that? One at a time, my friend. I mean, it's almost like when you build a brick wall in the beginning, it seems long, but when you take a, one of the greatest things I love to do is work with my hands because when you do something, you can see that you mowed the lawn, you built mm -hmm. the wall. And one by one, I know, as you were mentioning earlier, I made a difference, but at my friend's center, he was hiring a ton of people. And there was a large attrition rate as well. And so mm -hmm. I was getting classes of, you know, 50 to 100 people on a weekly basis for two days of training. And my training was a little bit on the CRM system and the phone system. But since I was a native speaker, they really just wanted me to get them attuned to the North American market and maybe give them some genre. I, since I was a communication major, decided to master phonetic micro expression reading where we can gauge uh, tell signs, sight unseen. I could expand on certain rhetoric, on word choice, on pausing. When I was given the luxury of a quality control department, looking at the KPIs and the charts that they had, I never realized that you could dissect the call. And they were doing it differently. What was interesting was they were almost doing the motor of the car when you and I were doing the outside and the paint, you know, and all the details. <laughs> and gotcha. I really wasn't into those sort of mechanics because I believe that you could fumble the worst call in the world, but if the person loves you, they'll carry you into the end zone. You know, they'll give you a thousand chances. So yeah. I was looking for more of the soft skills, the name drops you were mentioning, talking about their kitchen, hearing the dog in the background and asking the dog's name because you're cool like that. Remembering anniversaries and Daniel, I would give the most points. I give a bullseye when the client would say, your name, not in the introduction, nor the conclusion, but in the body of the call, because that's when you know you've anchored. That's when you know mm -hmm. you've connected with them. And the rest uh, is just walking with the sunshine on your face. Oh, man. Now, uh, Richard, there's like over 100 episodes that you've done, podcast uh -huh. episodes. Um, I, I Googled you, I definitely Googled you. 20 million links that are out there. For folks to wanting to know more about you, because I, I unfortunately, of course, can't fit everything about Richard into this uh, show, but uh, where can folks find more about you, whether it be online, social media? Well, they can buy a first class plane ticket and fly out of Philadelphia and come visit me down here. Which I hope <laughs> but uh, I got a huge Facebook fan page, 105 local Costa Rican Ticos. And once this goes live, Daniel, you're going to have thousands of new fans. But also, this is kind of cool. It will give your audience a real pulse of the business process outsourcing industry in Central America. Now, real quick, I'm north of Panama, south of Nicaragua. Costa Rica has the only democratic society in Central America. There's no hmm. standing army. So they put all that money back into education with a 95% literacy rate. We have the best wow. infrastructure. Companies such as Amazon, HP, Intel, and Oracle are here. We're known for medical tourism and finally, ecotourism. So if you like zip lining, monkeys, beaches, butterflies, iguanas, 
this is definitely yeah, me at beaches just that beaches way. <laughs> Maybe not as nice as the Jersey Shore, but it's pretty nice out here. I used to love my Margate and Ventnor, but what are you going to do? Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I appreciate that. And then um, also, uh, and we kind of touched on it before, but I definitely wanted to, um, since we got some time on here, yes. phonetic micro expression reading for mastering verbal tell signs. Can you speak on that? Yes. In fact, I have a chart here too. Let me pull this up for you. Love it. Can you see All that? Right. Yes, I can. Folks, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you do a screenshot and then take it away, Richard. Do you remember so in eighth grade when quick, you had a slide chart? Now, real quick, on the side, it said, what were the four words again? I'm sorry. Four Phonetic words were for expression reading. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Now, what were you saying? Back in what school? But phonetics is broken down into four parts. It's your tone rate, pitch, and duration. In my opinion, your tone is your consistent variable. It should be confident and empathetic. Individuals that teach sales training will talk about mirror imaging, and I do agree with that technique. But I think that if you're gonna be studying someone's phonetics, not semantics, their word choice, just the sound of speech, you don't wanna study the tone. You wanna study how fast and how loud they speak, their rate and their pitch. Now, by looking at this every 30 seconds to two minutes, you can gauge if there's a spike or a dip. If there is a spike or a dip, this is when you interject with a rebuttal or a tie down question. Now, once you see it, you can't unsee it. After three weeks, it becomes habit. And you're saying to me, but it, it, it sounds like something that is normal. Well, you're talking about micro expression reading when you're reading someone's body language. They're self adapting, object adapting, space, the aptics, the proxemics, what they do with their hair and their face. I'm talking about sight unseen. And I do believe that phonetics is the purest form of speech because by looking at something, there's congruence where audio matches the visual and there can be distractions or miscommunication. Someone's frowning could be happy. You never know. People cry right. when they win the lottery. Go figure. So I believe. <laughs> I broke any book. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And, and so right. when I was on the phone, and you know this, working at the call center, it becomes monotonous. It's the same thing. And for me, I was able to juggle and bite an apple, still be professional, but not act the fool. And by listening to these spikes and dips, I actually believe that I cracked a code, a real tell sign. But here's the thing, Daniel, you can always manipulate a tone. You can manipulate a, a rate and a pitch. But the one thing you can't do subconsciously is the answer is speed. I always believe that there's the insurance policy of your phonetic microexpression reading, because once again, you'd be lucky if you get four out of 10 consistently because your emotions are kicking in on that. And so if you're very astute, lucid, and you really pay attention to these calls, and that's why instead of just doing this halfway, getting your numbers and making your money, if you are very, very engaged in these calls and you're doing it thousands of times a month, there has to be in that controlled focus group environment ways for you to expand. And besides doing my job and getting good numbers, I was crushing it with the expression reading because I knew when they had a question, I knew when to repeat something again. I even kind of did the test, Daniel, this is fun. And I could tell. They'd ask for my phone number. I would give the phone number instead of asking if I would like to repeat it. I would say, Daniel, could you repeat it to me in case I went too quick? And then I could, in my mind, tell, mm. they wrote the number down. And I, well, I am, uh, Daniel, you didn't even write the number. I told you I went uh. too fast. Let me do it a second time. And that's when I could really test without hurting anybody if I was correct in regards to my phonetic microexpression reading. One of the tell signs was doing the readback of the toll-free number. And there's other areas mm. to see if they're engaged with you. If there's cross-talking or interruption, that's your fault. You're stepping on their toes. You're the rudder of their ship. They're leading it. It's all good. Grandma speaks slowly. She can't hear you. You got to be louder. And someone that has two minutes before they get into the tunnel might be screaming and going fast. Or mm -hmm. someone that's in their home is low and slow. It, it's, it goes all different ways. And I think besides the calls that you're making, forget what you're saying, match them. It's good, mm -hmm. integrated in your own pace. And you will see that you will be complimented as a very good listener. You'll know when to interject. And it's almost funny. You know how when animals kind of look like their, their owners, 
Don't be surprised yeah. by the end of the call. You don't sound like the person that you're speaking with. <laughs> Cause you messed them so well. No, that's, Oh man, I love that. Listen, Daniel John... son, you got it from Mr. Miyagi. Good man. Yeah. <laughs> Shishini. Shishini. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I just love everything, man, that you've just been dropping. Uh, one question I want to ask you uh, before yeah. we wrap up. Um, what advice, Because and I know you do it constantly, man. It's, it's just showing in your energy. When people are facing obstacle hurdles, they're having that bad day in the call center, or they're just not making the quote-unquote numbers, what advice do you typically usually give, or even if it's more than one, um, to folks that may be struggling or hitting that wall and not sure where to turn. Prevention is better than a cure. If you're at that stage, something worked up to that for it to pop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just not one random weird day. I mean, once again, you, you've been pressing on that leg so much, eventually it snaps. Mm -hmm. I believe in dedicated practice. Maybe if you prepared yourself prior to the fight, you'd win or go the distance. And also be coachable. If something happens, first I'll ask someone, may I make a suggestion? Daniel will say yes. And then prior to telling you what happened, I'll explain in my own terms what I did when I was a freshman making phone calls and how I learned from it and how I'm gonna pass it forward to you. And, and, that's, and that's how it's done. And yeah. also I, I can't help individuals on their own forced marches. I'm not gonna hit the ball and drag Johnny. It's just not how it goes. But if you need some resetting, if we need to regroup a little bit and find your focus and balance, I'm cool with that. But if someone is struggling because they're not practicing or if they're showing up late or if they're doing things they shouldn't during lunch and they're not making their calls, that's on you. You're not a kid anymore. It's, it's time to be a big boy and it's time to step up to the plate because my clients depend on you, families depend on you. And so I have, as I mentioned earlier, as long as they're not really breaking labor laws, I do wiggle room. I, I really try to give second or third chances because I've been given second and third chances. And I understand what an 18 year old Richard would have done if Norman Schmidt did not write me that letter of recommendation where my life would be today. And, and so I wanna be that best coach that best teacher, and if I get that honor, the best mentor they ever had. Love that, man. Love that. Well, Richard, I couldn't have asked for a better closer, man. So I want to thank you again so much for your time. My, my interviews typically last 20, 30 minutes. I think we're like near an hour. Uh, but it's a just the interview. The what do you say? If yeah. you didn't do this, then, then, then you know how pissed they'd be. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, but no, I really appreciate having you on here, man. Definitely want to have you come back on, you know, for us to do a follow-up, see what's it. going on. And, uh, you know, if uh, things are looking brighter in the future, we'd say, well, hey, maybe we'll just do the interview down in Costa Rica, man, which, you know, I'm always, always for. So get, get, get the missus out the house, man. She would love it. So well, I'm giving you a virtual high five. You are my Damn, main man. Damn, taking it, taking it back, taking it back. Appreciate All it, All right. Man. All right. All right. Thank you for tuning in to the RNG Radio Show. Be sure to like and subscribe for more episodes and future content. If you'd like to learn more, visit us at danielumstead.com. Stay blessed, my fellow millionaires.